Good afternoon, my name is Elise Hatton and I'm Rockhampton Regional Council Smart Hub Business Manager and it is my pleasure to welcome you, now I have to remember, September's Lunch and Learn. Uh, the months are definitely rolling by. Uh, it's with great pleasure that we have a fantastic um, presenter today. It's with great pleasure that I'm introducing Matthew Doyle. That's, he's going to share with us how to get either your first 100 customers or your next 100 customers. And Matthew will be speaking from, definitely from experience. So um, Matthew knows all the practical tips and tools as well as how to think about your market and so forth to be able to ensure that you get your first or next 100 customers. Um, I did ask Matt for a quirky fact. We weren't able to find one. So without any further ado, I'll introduce Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Elise. I think what we said beforehand was just ask somebody else. If you ask anybody else that's been around the Smart Hub long enough, they'll have quirky facts everywhere and they, they'll be able to tell you <laughs> plenty. So, um, all right, so what, to start off, what if I was just to ask the question, who needs or wants more customers in your business? Actually, put your hand up and say that. It's everybody in the room. Absolutely. So that's what we're here to talk about. We're, we're going to talk about how you can get the first or the next 100 customers into your business whatever kind of business it is that you're running. As I talk about my own personal journey and story and, and sort of what I've learned, we're going to focus a lot on an online-based business. But the reality is the principles and the tactics we're talking about don't only apply to running an online-only business. They, they're things that we can apply in any business whatsoever. Oh, and our clicker's decided not to work again, Sean. It's not the batteries this time. We fixed the battery problem. Go to the backup plan. Oh. Nope. Try again. <laughs> All right. Just gonna put the from the beginning up there again. We'll just try again. Okay, that'll work. Let's just do it that way. Nice and quick. Technology is great when it works. Awesome. So before we actually go into the, the practical hints and the, the principles that we want to talk about in our presentation today, um, it's best to tell a quick story of how we actually got here, how I came to be um, telling this presentation. And so I, I've been around the Smart Hub for quite some time. I'd say almost part of the furniture. I come over from next door when we were um, in the temporary digs next door. And I started out as a, a business consultant, a business coach. Um, and that business you know, took a few different angles before I finally found what was probably the sweet spot for that business. Um, and then in 2018, as you know, a lot of people around the Smart Hub now know, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And as he prepared to get ready for school at the end of that year or to start kindergarten the following year, I sat down one Saturday afternoon trying to figure out how to best distill all the information that we needed to take to the school and to help them survive. And on the back of my then uh, the sales funnel platform I was using, ClickFunnels, I basically just built this basic little membership based website that anyone I gave access to could log in, see his information, learn how to do what they needed to do and it just gave them access to information all the time instead of trying to remember everything that we unloaded on them at the start of the year. When I sat down with my diabetes educator and I asked her, can you look at this for me? Can you, basically, can you tell me what's wrong or what's missing? Her first step was, I need all of my clients to be using that. And so, of course, the light bulb went on at that point and I realized that there was probably a business opportunity here to actually commercialize what we'd built um, for Levi or to help him and to help us and the school. Um, but also, you know, this is, you know, when a, when a person with diabetes reaches the age of 21, a lot of their subsidy stuff goes away. They've got to, you've got to pay for a lot more stuff personally. Um, and so for me, it's like, oh, well, if we can commercialise this and work, and it works, this could actually provide that sort of slush fund we need to help Levi through um, the rest of his life once he's not as subsidised anymore. And then quickly realise, actually, no, we could help an awful lot more people by commercialising this than just my own son. But there's one big problem. I might have slapped that website together but I'm not, my background's not actually in mobile development, app development, that kind of thing. I, I'm all right on the front end of stuff, but when it comes to actually writing code and developing something, no idea. Or at least the very basic of ideas. 
So in the middle of last year when everybody was sort of at, um, you know, everybody was sitting around at home, as we all were at the time, I started to put a bit more time and effort in how to, how to get this up off the ground. Obviously, it was just a side project on the side of running my, my coaching business at the time. And I was trying to think of what I needed to do to raise enough money in order to pay developers to actually build what I was trying to build. And so that came around to um, having a meeting with somebody from California who had run a lot of Kickstarter projects and talking about, okay, because my goal was, all right, how do I raise, I don't know, a, a million dollars through a Kickstarter project or something so I can put on a team of developers and we can make this thing happen. And he said to me at the time, um, he introduced me to a platform called Bubble. And Bubble's a, a no-code uh, web development platform. He said to me, why don't you just build something, start selling it, and fund it that way, and then you can get more technical once you've done that. And so that's how we get to this journey of how we get this, the first 100, or for us, we tried to run the first 1,000 um, people via a, a pre-launch campaign. And so a lot of the principles we're going to talk about are the things that I learned when it comes to, okay, how do we get that first, we're talking about 100 today, but for us the goal was how do we get that first 1,000 people before we even launch this platform um, and, and make it happen really, really quickly. So it all starts here. This is one of those things that, Normally we tell you, or if I tell you, you know, need to know who your customer is, you might say at that point, well, really, isn't that just common sense? The problem is that it is. It is common sense. But go and try business coaching for a little while, and you'll learn that common sense is very rarely common <coughs> practice. And, I mean, I teach this all the time. Know who your customer is, know who your customer is, and then I'm really bad myself for actually acting on it in my own business quite a lot. Um, but so the first rule when it comes to getting 100, your first 100 or your next 100 customers into the business is actually knowing who that customer is. And the amount of times, again, that I sit down with people and they go, who's your customer that you're trying to serve this for? And they go, oh, anybody. Okay, that's a recipe for disaster. We need to know intimately who the customer is that we're trying to get into the business. And it starts by actually building a really complete persona of what your customer looks like. Now, you might have heard of things like a client customer avatar and all these other terms that are used. I used the term buyer persona for no reason other than that was the first term I discovered when I was learning. So that's just what stuck with me. But whatever it works for you, it's all the same thing. It starts by actually having a really good demo, understanding of the demographic profile of what your customer looks like. So you know, if we're going to try and attract 100 people, we actually need to know what those 100 people look like. But and a really, really good demographic profile. Are they predominantly men? Are they predominantly women? Are they predominantly in a particular age group? Do they live in a particular area? Are they particularly high income, low income? All of that kind of stuff, really going really deep into how, who they are. When you do that, you can get a really good understanding of what their goals and ambitions are. You can then understand what their, the hopes and challenges that they have. What are the, we might call, pain points that they're suffering on, on any given day and they need to particularly in the area that you're looking to serve. And then, of course, how you help them. So if they've got goals, how does what you've got to offer help them get where they want to go? If they've got challenges, how does your, what you've got to offer pull them away from those challenges or take away that pain that they've got? By understanding it, you can then spell out what you have to fix it or what you have to get them where they want to go. And, of course, understanding what their objections are going to be. Why are these people that you want to serve going to tell you no? Because if you can understand before they say no and understand what they're going to say, you already know how to bring them through that objection. So understanding all of these things, give your persona a name and a picture. Okay? In my business, uh, my business coaching practice, my, my NDIS-focused business coaching practice, my number one buyer persona, there's a man and a woman, then Neville and Nancy. So whenever I'm building an advertising campaign, whenever I'm building a product, whenever I'm just trying to create some sort of content or planning something, I'm always thinking, what do Neville and Nancy need now? What are Neville and Nancy suffering with at the moment? What are they griping about? And I've got pictures that I looked at. I should have put them in the presentation, but I've got a picture of a man. They're just stock photo pictures, but they put a human face to this persona, this idea of a customer. That, and so now, when I'm building something, I'm building it for them. When I'm writing something or, build, or creating something, I'm creating it for them. When I'm speaking to someone, I'm speaking to them. If you could be on a webinar of 1,500 people, you're speaking to Neville and Nancy. And if you're doing that and I'm getting that right, the reality is I should be striking a chord with most of the other people in the room and on that space. 
and yeah, build for, connect with, and sell to whoever your persona is and whatever the, the name is that you've given them. The next step to getting that first 100 or um, next 100 in really fast is what I'd say, sell off the plan. In other words, sell something before you've built it. We see this in property all the time. If people buy houses, units, apartments off the plan before they've actually been built. In your business, when you're whether you're launching a brand new business, just a brand new product, whatever it might be, for most things, you can follow this principle of selling off the plan and, and sell it before you've actually built it. This is what we were doing with Diabetes Dashboard. Before we'd actually built it, or as we were building it, we were already selling it up front um, to bring in those customers so we had something to launch with. So take those pre-launch or pre-sale offers. Um, I think it's actually the last point, but I'll get there now. Is obviously, when you're selling pre-launch, we need to be upfront that that's what we're doing. Don't sell somebody in a, in a pre-launch phase on a product that they're going to think is actually going to be there right, and, you know, and will ship in the next two days. Um, if you're taking pre-sale or pre-launch offers, you need to be upfront that it is a pre-launch platform. But literally, all you need to do that, particularly if you're selling online, for if you've got a landing page and a, and a payment gateway, you can start selling something straight away. And that actually, to do that, it takes you about half a day to set up that landing page and that payment infrastructure. Um, there's all sorts of platforms you can use to do it. But obviously, there's, you know, you've got to nurture and communicate with them on an ongoing basis. You need something to drive them to that landing page, etc. But in reality, to actually make it and to start selling, that's all you need, that one page and some way to take people's money. Set the timeline for delivery. So we talked about, you know, if it's pre-launch, make sure you're actually telling them and giving them this timeline for when it'll be that you'll actually deliver the product. So that there's that certainty. And if there is a, say you've got a gap of, <laughs> you're selling now for 90 days, make sure that there's communication during that time as well. So you're actually keeping people connected. Um, so one of the great principles talking about it is, um, you know, I said with us, we were looking at how do we raise raise fund, we looked at all sorts of opportunities. I workshopped a lot of stuff with the Lees, I talked to a lot of people, I, I looked at, you know, could I find a thousand health professionals that would, would contribute a thousand dollars for, for the, you know, the, to help us raise that money that we needed to actually get the platform developed. We looked at Kickstarter, we looked at all those other options. A lot of people go and look at, you know, maybe raising that early stage capital, but the reality is the best investor in any business is going to be a customer. So the sooner you can put something in front of somebody that allows them to buy from you, um, it's also the, the most reliable form of validation is a sale. So if you're trying to launch a product or you're trying to launch a new business, the moment that somebody puts, pulls out their credit card and gives you their money is the moment you know that you're onto a winner. When I first launched Provider Academy, I put the Facebook page up and it wasn't called Provider Academy at the time. I didn't even know what to call this thing. I just had this brainwave that the NDIS needed a lot of this business support. I'd put the Facebook page up and I literally hadn't even got, you know, the 25 likes from your mum and all her friends you get just to bump the numbers up when you first create a new Facebook page. And I get messages from people saying, how do you help, what, what do you do that, to help our business? So for me that was kind of, okay, we're on the right path here. But it wasn't until you put something out there and people started to pay for it that you knew that, oh, okay, we are on, on the right, we are on the right field. And the problem when it comes with, if you've got a new business or a new product or a new idea, you can ask existing customers of your business, you can put out surveys, um, you, can, you can go to that real sort of worst level of validation and ask your mum, because 99 times out of 100 your mum will tell her it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, but you can ask your friends, you can ask your mum, you can even ask people that fit your buyer persona and everybody can be yes, 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 but until the moment comes that they pull out that, that credit card and actually pay for it, you haven't really validated it. So the sooner you can do that, the sooner you know you're on the right path. So the next step, once we know what our customer is and we realise that we can sell off the plan, is we need to create what we call an irresistible offer. In other words, an offer that you put out there and it just seems like an absolute no-brainer to whoever that customer is that you figured out in step one. So again, an irresistible offer solves your buyer persona's number one problem right now. So if your number one problem right now is, you know, you've got a business with no customers, if I can solve that problem for you, would that be an irresistible offer? Again, in that, in that business coaching sphere, we, we have a group of people that's got, you know, we've got I think just over 600 people in this Facebook group now uh, that are in that market that fit our Neville and Nancy persona. Um, and we ask them what their number one problem is right now. And we do that for a specific reason. 
because if we know what the majority of people's number one problem is, we know what we need to focus on to solve it. And quite often that's exactly the same thing. How do I get clients? How do I get customers? Which is what you see in the business coaching world. But in other, in other areas, in whatever your business is, that's going to be different. But if your irresistible offer or if your offer solves your, their number one problem, then you're on the right path. The value that you offer them needs to be greater than the price you charge. Again, it's easy in coaching to think, we, try, we put this sort of arbitrary idea around, if I'm gonna charge you $1,500 for something, then in reality, you should feel like there's $15,000 of value or return to your business in, in, in paying that. So, but whatever it is, the value to your customer, whether that's monetary value, personal value, whatever it may be, you need your offer, if it can clearly show that you're providing more value, than the price that you're charging, then it'll, you'll be on a winner. And you're much less likely to get objections around price. Because in a lot of areas, the number one objection will be, it costs too much. But the reality is, it just doesn't show me enough value. One of the, one of the best, or best marketing ones you've got, of course, is scarcity and time limits. So um, if you're running a pre-launch offer, there's only this amount available, and the pre-launch offer ends here. Once we get to that point, you won't get it, and you won't get it. Um, you know, for us with Diabetes Dashboard, pay for, a, pay for a year, get it for life. That was the headline of the, the offer that we put out there, pay for a year, get it for life. Um, if you bought pre-launch, once we got to 1,000 people, uh, or before we got to the actual official release, that, you know, once we hit those dates, it was all over. So that creates that sc scarcity and the time limits that create urgency for people to respond to your offer. <coughs> um, Using bonuses or bundles are another way to, to ensure that people, you know, boost that value that people are going to get. So bundle things with it. Um, you can use the bonuses or the bundles that go with your offer. So again, make it more irresistible or to increase the value. Or you can actually use it as a second step or an upsell once people, when somebody buys the initial product to cover your cost of getting them in the door in the first place. So there's different ways you can use those. But again, adding more value and often you can add more value without adding much more expense from your point of delivering that product. And the last thing about an irreversible offer is they, they reverse the risk from the customer to you. So if I'm gonna pay you for something, for specifically if I'm gonna pay you for something that you're not actually delivering for another month or three months, that's a risk for me. Something might go wrong in those three months and you may never deliver, but you've already invested what I paid you in trying to get it there. Um, and so if you can re reverse that risk by giving me a, a money back guarantee that you deliver or I get my money back, it just takes that risk away. Um, and <coughs> if that risk is taken away, it lifts the value in uh, what, you're, what you're offering me. The other thing that, or one of the other things that a, a universal offer, uh, sorry, an irresistible offer does is it asks what we call a universal question. What did I ask right at the very beginning of my, my presentation? Who in the room wants more customers or needs more customers? How many hands went up in the room? Everyone's. So if you can put a pitch out there to every one of your, where every one of your customers or potential customers that you've identified in your buyer persona goes, yep, that's me, then you're on the right path in this irresistible offer because you know you've hit that. And that's basically what a universal question is. You should be able to ask this question to your audience and everyone, or almost everyone, says, yes, that's me. And in doing that, utilize the three most powerful words that I have found, well, that I've learned in marketing. And they're the words, have you ever? Have you ever felt X, Y, Z? Have you ever experienced this problem? Have you ever noticed how this goes on? Yeah. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to get that traction and get those first few customers in? Again, who needs more customers? Everybody's hands go up. If I then ask you, have you ever noticed how hard it is? Uh, again, there'd be hands going up everywhere. So now once I go, you know, have you ever realized and noticed this? There's the connection between you and I. There's the connection between you and the message because you kind of go, oh, th this person understands me. They get what I'm trying to do or they get the situation that I'm in. And maybe if they get it, they can get me over the, or, you know, maybe they can get me to where I want to go. And so then, if you've created that feeling, that offer it now becomes somewhat irresistible to the person at the other end. There's another one, I don't think I've included in there, if we, if we come to it, we come to it, but it's when, when there are objections in there. If you can, in, your, in that irresistible offer, so in your landing page or your video or whatever you're creating, use terms like, 
you might be thinking, suddenly you're also connecting with the objection. You know, yeah, you know, you might say, oh, Matt, this is great if you're running an online business, but I run a corner shop trying to sell a new line of cupcakes and I want to get 100 people to buy them. How's that going to work for me? Okay, and that's what, you know, I addressed that at the front of this presentation about how the principles apply no matter what. But you, if you can say that, you know, already say, you know, you might say this is why it won't work for me. You might say that's why it won't work for me. And then go in and tell them about why it's actually made for them. You're, again, playing in and making that offer irresistible because you're actually showing that you understand why they don't think it'll work and diffusing that at the same time by answering the question before they even ask it. At this point, we should also remember the number one rule, and uh, this comes from Russell Brunson from ClickFunnels, and he's, he calls it the number one rule of direct response marketing. I just call it the number one rule in general, that a confused mind always says no. So if you're trying to pitch an, what we might call an irresistible offer, you're trying to pre-launch this, and I can't understand what it does, I can't understand who it helps, I can't understand how to, I'll move on. If we're looking at websites, do you know how long you've got to capture someone's attention when they go to your website? As I understand it, and, and Jason might have a different view, but as I understand it, it's about seven seconds. From the time someone hits the website, you've got about that amount of time to capture their attention, or they'll move on. Um, another one can be if, say, if you're running ads to drive people to this offer to try and bring clients in, and there's a disconnect between what your ad says and what I see when, when that sales page or landing page opens up, you'll create that confusion and that friction again. So remember that a confused mind always says no. The next principle that we want to go by is find the crowd. Would you prefer to try and get 100 individual customers or connect with 10 people who send you 10 customers each? Again, this is a big one that we, we talk about and promote in our NDIS business. We'll say to providers, if you can connect with a service coordinator who is themselves, their entire job is to try and find services to connect you know, their clients with the services they need. So they might have multiple clients that have similar needs. So if you can provide a service or connect with them and provide to them a service that you know, serves the needs of five, six, seven of their clients and therefore serves their need of being able to place six or seven people in one go, you've now created a situation where instead of you finding seven individual clients, one person will send you seven. So if you can find the crowd, de determine who already has access to, your, to pools of the ideal customer that you're looking for. For us, what we look at is, as part of Diabetes Dashboard, we've built a, <coughs> we've built a, a health professional platform, so a complete practice management suite for health professionals. And so if we can connect with a health professional, there is a huge value add to them by having their clients, their patients using our individual or personal user platform. So just because of the value it provides to them, they're likely to recommend to their patients to use it. So do I want to try and find a thousand personal individual users, or do I want to try and find maybe a hundred health professionals who will each bring along ten of their clients? And so as part of our launch, our goal was to get our first 1,000. We also aimed for 250 health professionals for that very reason. The more health professionals we can get, the less one-by-ones we have to get to get the individual users signed up as well. Connect with them. That's pretty obvious. Find out who's got the pool of customers. They're no good to you if you can't connect with them. And again, um, create a, you need to create a win-win situation between you and them. If, if I've got a connection to 100 people that you want to target as your potential customers, just coming to me and going, can you refer me some people, doesn't really provide that win-win situation. So you've got to, you know, provide, create opportunity or provide value in that relationship between you and that person that's got access to pools of your customers. For us, again, it was by providing an actual platform for those health professionals, but then having the you know, the value, of, the value to them of having the individuals using the same connected platform. And it works both ways. So for us, it's actually valuable to our personal users for their health professional to be using the same platform to manage their practice. And so we can go the other way and actually encourage personal users who sign up by themselves to invite their health professional to follow them on the platform. Create opportunities to actually sell to multiple people at the same time. So things like doing webinars. You can promote a pre-launch, depending on what it is you're launching, you can promote a pre-launch to webinars. And yes, you've got to get people to turn up to the webinar. But now instead of trying to sell one at a time, you could be selling to 100 people at a time on that webinar. 
Other opportunities are uh, events. Again, you get the opportunity to speak to multiple people at an event, um, speaking to multiple people at once. Um, getting on podcasts. You might, you might be able to connect with somebody who runs a podcast that's got a thousand of your Neville and Nancy on it. How long is it going to take you to try and talk to a thousand of those guys in order to try and get a hundred of them to join as opposed to talking to one person who gives you the opportunity to pitch to a thousand listeners in one go? So podcasts can be a great opportunity and the same, you know, you've got people that do things on YouTube that will do, uh, you know, interview people and that's, and often they're looking for people to connect with to keep, to create content and tell stories. So as long as you've got an interesting story, a decent, you know, and provide a decent amount of value, it's not just a, an opportunity to get there and flog whatever it is you're trying to sell, you'll often get the opportunity to then promote what it is that you, you hope you sell to their audience. Um, referral networks are another great opportunity, so actually connecting through, whether it's networking events or, you know, chambers of commerce, smart hubs, all those kind of opportunities where through a network of people under, that you can refer to one another. So again, there could be, in this room, for whatever you do, there could be people in here connected to pools of the people that you want to connect with. And instead of having to try and find 100 one by ones, it might be that five of us in this room could each refer you 20 people. And there's your 100. This was the one that kind of was the kick in the pants for me. If you want to get the first 100 or the next 100, you've just got to get started doing something. It's really, really easy to keep kicking the can down the road, trying to make the product better, trying to change things, can it just keep planning more things, keep doing it. But in reality, if you want to start getting customers, just start putting it out there. And you know, it, again, if you're going to go pre-launch, one, you're putting it out there and starting to bring the customers, and two, once you start to get people paying for it, it really creates the uh, incentive that you need to actually get it finished and produced because now you have to deliver for somebody who paid you. Okay? So, but great question there, and I have to ask myself this question quite regularly. What's one thing you're going to do by the end of today to get the first or the next person into the business? Um, I have a, another question I, I've recently started asking myself that I won't repeat out loud because it includes a, a rather nice profanity, but basically, what the heck have you done today to make this happen? You can fill in the gaps as to where those words might be slightly different. But, so, but just get started doing something and that will put you on the road to getting 100, those next 100 or the first 100 customers. You won't get them by planning, by dreaming, by tinkering on the product and trying to make the product better. You know what, the product will never be perfect. Somebody asked me the other day with Diabetes Dashboard about when, when we actually consider it finished. It will never be finished. It will never be finished because we'll always need to try and make it better. We'll always have different, customers will always have different needs. There'll be bugs to fix from time to time. But the reality is it will never be finished because if it's finished, once it's finished, we stop getting better. Um, and if you wait until it's finished, you'll always find a reason for it not to be finished. So if we just get started, we're away. I love, and this probably goes back to an earlier point, but I only come across this tweet this morning. And you, know, you can launch your, your website with a, a dodgy, uh, sorry, launch your startup with a dodgy website and still be successful. You just have to start. And you might not be launching a startup. You might just be launching you know, a business that might not fit what people define as a startup. Or maybe you're launching a new product or a new platform in an existing business. It still holds true. You can launch it with the dodgiest logo, the dodgiest website, whatever else, if, particularly if your offer is good and it speaks to what your customers want and need. You've just got to start doing it. So I throw this one as a bit of a bonus point. This one actually, when you're trying to sort of build and move fast, this can be a bit more of a slower burn strategy. But think like a media company, in, particularly in the way you do some of your marketing and advertising. Obviously, know your audience. But um, what does a media company do in reality? If you think about particularly the traditional media companies. They produce content, that's, or they produce it, or they acquire it that's designed for a specific audience that they want to connect with um, to get you know, the most people watching their platform and then they leverage that attention to sell advertising space to people. That's pretty much you know, media in a nutshell. So know who your audience is, which we've already talked about. Create and publish content that engages and captures their attention. So again, answers those questions they are asked, means something to them, captures their attention and engages with them. And then leverage that attention to sell what you've got. And by that point, you've already built connection and relationship with them. Like I said, this is not something that's, you know, this takes a long, longer time to build up and burn. It's not something you're going to launch today and suddenly sell 100 people in the next week. But long term, building that ongoing momentum, it's an extra thing. The other thing 
um, this is from a, a business coach by the name of Wes Hone. That, um, this was sort of revolutionary for me at the time. At the time that I come across this quote, I was, my first thought was I just want to get enough people in the business so that I can then pay somebody else to do the marketing and sales so I don't have to do it anymore. But he makes this comment that instead of thinking about, you know, if I go around the room and I say, you know, what business do you run? You know, we could say I, I run a tour and, and training business, I run a photography and, and social media platform, et cetera, et cetera. Reframe it and say, I run a sales and marketing business that provides whatever your service is. So I don't, you know, I don't run a diabetes management platform company. I run a sales and marketing business that provides an all-in-one diabetes management solution. And so for me, that, that then puts sales and marketing at the very core of what I do each and every day. And if sales and marketing is at the core of what I do and I view that as integral to how I lead the business, then at that point, I'm much more likely to achieve that goal <coughs> of, of getting the, the first or next 100 customers in because it's the core of what I'm doing, is trying to sell that product and put it in someone's hands. All right, so just to sort of recap, if we want to you know, go on this journey to get our first or our next 100 customers in, know who that customer is, sell off the plan. In other words, sell it before you've built it as much as you can. Create that irresistible offer. Find the crowd, so find out who's got pools of the customers I'm trying to reach so I can connect with multiple all at once. Um, again, think like a media company, that's gonna be more about building long-term momentum. Um, remember that you actually run a marketing and sales business and that's probably the most important point on there of all of them. And of course, just get started, just, just do it. Again, I haven't forgotten that I've said know your customer. I keep putting that on every slide because you, know, you can't get the, the next 100 customers if you don't know who they are. So you've gotta know them, you've gotta know intimately who they are. Be where their attention is and make it easy for them to buy from you. You're not gonna get customers if you make it difficult or you don't make it easy for them to, to buy from you. Building a community of raving mad fans, that goes back to a bit of that thinking like a media company, connecting with it, you know, building um, people excitement and, and effectively, you know, this community of people who are all connected around what it is that you offer and what you provide. When you do that, you not only create long-term engagement with whatever it is you're building, you also create that FOMO from the ones on the outside who aren't part of that community. If you look at that Facebook group I talked about before where you've got over 600 people in there, somebody just gets in there and talks about, they just ask a question about something in one of our programs or about an event coming up and suddenly there's other people in there going, what's this, what am I missing out on? And it's because of this community that's built up around it, creates it. Um, so, and at the end, move fast, fail fast, pivot, and break through at the end. And just to finish off, there's a few different resources there that you can go and get. So, um, the buyer persona template for the one that, this is the one that I use, I've, I've modified it slightly, but that's the HubSpot one. So if you go to the, that um, bit.ly link there, that will, it will go to a blog page for HubSpot where they talk about it, and you can actually download a copy of, of theirs for free. Um, Secret is a really cool one I come across around, you know, during that time uh, during ISO last year when I really started digging into building diabetes dashboard. Um, it costs, I think it's a, the first year it costs you about a 190 something US to join and it's 35 a year after that. But in the 12 months since I joined that, I've probably accessed between 20 and $30,000 of free stuff that you can, so it's got all sorts of, you know, free trials um, and all sorts of, to just, any number of different, um, any number of different platforms. Now, if you use that link to sign up, they'll take five bucks off my subscription, just full disclosure, right? Um, and the other great one is, if you're looking at a tech product, is this idea of 100 days of no code. And it's a really great platform, or really great sort of, you, you, it's, again, it's a community of people who are seeing what can you build and, and deliver in 100 days, using all of these different no code development tools that are out about this. So obviously, if you're, you're trying to, your business is kind of a, physical product on the corner store, it might not be your thing, but if you're looking at something from a tech perspective, really, really great uh, to get part, to be part of as well. Um, and it actually has a bunch of other bonuses and, and perks that you can get hold of as well. But that's it, that's it for me. Anybody, questions or anything? Hmm? Okay, I have a question. Um, okay. Yep. 
So a question I get around that a lot is, can you only have one buyer persona? Like, as if it's, there's this hard, fast rule that you can only have one. Most businesses will have at different points, you'll have either different customers, even for the same product, you might actually have different types of customers. So one of, the, one of the basic things I would say is for particular campaigns, you might try and focus on a particular customer. But just because you know, that doesn't mean they're the only customer you can ever serve. I would say if you're, again, you're trying to get that first 100 or the, the next 100, focus on one particular type of customer to get that next 100. But I mean, we've got this in our business. We've got health professionals. We've got adults who have got diabetes of some description. And even the diff there's a difference between somebody who's got type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Um, we can have personal users who have got uh, gestational diabetes. We can have, um, we've got schools are a part of our, our network. And we've got parents of people with diabetes. So these are all different types of customers for us. But we kind of decide in each campaign who we're going to try and connect with and who we're going to try and focus on. So if you are going to try and say, my, my set goal is to get the first 100, Perhaps look at those different kinds of, you know, build the persona for the different kinds of customers and try and land on which one you think is probably the number one right now that is going to move really fast. Just out of interest, who, who can get up and, and I, won't, I won't be there, but just interested. Raise your hand if you know your customer so well to the point where you have a photo on your wall and you've given them a name and you can describe them as well as you can describe yourself. Excellent, Jason. I mean, part of, part of the, the, what makes it a little bit easier with part of Diabetes Dashboard is my ideal customer is me. So it's really easy to know what I'm thinking and feeling and what my wife's going through. But that's only part of our customer network too. So if we focus on just us and try and account, we will still hit a brick wall really quickly. Please tell me that the photo you use on the website is not yours. No, it's not me. <laughs> I don't know. It's not me. I've got, uh, I, I still use a stock photo. I mean, I could use a photo of a really good friend who also fits the profile, but no, I don't do that either. Um, it's, it's a stock photo, I promise. And it's not named Matthew either. So. Any other questions? What's the best technology to, to use to build your funnel if you're going to go online? If you're just trying to get a, a landing page out there and, and start quickly to build that funnel, I would use something like ClickFunnels. Um, get, Click funnels, so you know, particularly it's got all the you know it's got all the things that you might want to plug in like your email and your payment gateway and all that's all built in in one so it's all out of the box in one thing. You don't have to try and patch too many different things together. The interface is really 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 easy to use. Um, once you get up and running, uh, you know, it's got a 14 day free trial and then you're looking at 97 US a month, um, which and you could start at that level. You know, it's, it, the next tier up is 297 a month, but you really don't need to pay for that upgrade until you're already making the money that, that would fund that anyway. So 97 bucks a month, and with a 14 day free trial, if you actually sit down and do the knowing your customer first and mapping out what it's gonna look like, you start on day one, it takes you half a day to build it, and you've got 13 and a half days to make your first month subscription by getting it out there anyway. Awesome. Matt, you're amazing. There's something for you behind mm -hmm. our banner. Let me grab it. Oh, can you move it up a bit? There we go. Matthew Doyle, Diabetes Dashboard, thank you so much for presenting thank you. to for us today. You're welcome.
challenges of your life. Because in the end, at the end of the day, really, when you think about your life, it's time. You get born and you die, and what you have in the middle is a heap of time. So you want to use that really well. You don't want to waste your time. And so the 14th of October, keep an eye out for the marketing on Facebook and in your emails. And if you're interested, come along and yep, I'll be presenting that one. 14th of October, mental health. We also have other programs during that week, so just keep your eye out for those programs. Some are for members only, others are open to anyone. So keep your eyes out on Facebook and on your emails. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you.